businesses and properties and they're replaced by non-taxable entities, the situation just snowballs and gets worse. New London becomes more poor and there are fewer people, fewer taxable property owners that are bearing the burden of paying for the cost of city services. Um, and those city services become more burdened and, they, and we need to hire more police. We need to hire more fire people, fire, uh, Firemen, firefighters, thank you. Um, because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people in New London that need this type of service now. So I, I would suggest that's an unintended consequence of urban renewal. Um, as more disadvantaged people move to the city, they required more services. The services came here to provide them meals, to provide them counseling, to provide them whatever service they needed. Um, but it's the city's remaining taxpayers, and mostly, uh, primarily residential now, that are, that are paying for that. Well, Urban Rail will also put a big premium on civic and cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. There was a shortage of in cities at the time. So nonprofits are among those. Yes. Can I ask Jim, though, how effective the pilot that Connecticut finally did uh, get or enact? Uh, I thank you for what you said, not terribly effective. It's, it's never been fully funded by the state. Not even um, close. Not even close. And it's uh, pretty much nil right now. So, um, I, as I recall, over 50% of New London, remember only 6.1 square miles, um, over 50% of the land area of New London does not pay property tax. In addition to the human service agencies, we're very fortunate to have <laughs> Three very fine public uh, not public, excuse me, three very fine higher education institutions, Connecticut College, Mitchell College, and the United States Coast Guard Academy. We also have many state agencies. And New London was the county seat way back when, so at one time people came to New London to worship. Uh, we have more churches um, and, and synagogues than any municipality in southeastern Connecticut. They, of course, don't pay taxes. And it's just a fact. It's happened that way. So yeah. that goes back to the issue of uh, of a of a of a viable uh, boundary area for a municipality to be able to sustain to be able to sustain itself. Clearly, New London has historically been the regional center and provided this 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 large this large uh, range of, 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 of services and, uh, and institutions and entertainment, and stuff, which is a function of, of a real city. Uh, but what has been detached from it is the ability to support it. Um, the, the notion, I can remember uh, going to Hartford with uh, City Manager Driscoll. We, we had a number of bills filed uh, <coughs> with the legislature for consideration of what we privately call reparations payments. Our surrounding neighbors were benefiting from, from the city performing this function, taking the poor, taking those that had some problems or illnesses or what have you, coming to the city uh, and then not, uh, you know, not participating in the cost of that. Uh, at this point, the legislature, uh, way back in the 70s, had the, the, the power structure move from kind of the urban dominance in the legislature to suburban, and every year that would uh, get kind of, thank you very much, and get laughed out of it, and dies in committee, and over and over and over. And, and, and the urban areas still try various tax sharing uh, Initiatives over over the years, and none of them have have uh, received any serious consideration at all. And uh, and uh, I think that's you know that's that's a real problem. If some of that got solved, uh, the city could do a much better job throughout, them, from the physical side to to the social social side that it uh, that it supports, and and would would remove the kind of the disproportionate burden. That's placed upon uh, local residents. Um, well, we've touched on a lot of things. I guess I would say that um, we're 
living in a nation today where I think there's tremendous inequity um, between cities. We have the cities that are prospering, you know, New York, Washington, San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, you know, maybe Atlanta, you know, and then you've got the Baltimores and the Bridgeports and the Clevelands and the, you know, and so we have this a, a nation of real difference in how cities are doing, but I think the, 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 the great problem is that even in the cities that are doing well, there still are many of the same problems that these urban renewers were trying to deal with in the 1950s. The issues of affordable housing are <coughs> tremendous, whether a city is actually rich or poor today. Um, the, uh, if you're at a, a fire economy, you know, of finance, insurance, real estate, tech, you know, you're, you're doing well, but other people who are there living in those cities to service the, the people who may are now living downtown not, and not fleeing to the suburbs are in many ways struggling um, with schools that often aren't adequate in unaffordable housing and so forth. Urban infrastructure, even in the prosperous city like Boston where I live, is in terrible shape because we haven't invested in it. So we have an MBTA that's barely limping along uh, because we have not been investing in the public goods. And, you know, we've not been, uh, cities can't do that as we've said on their own. It really, I think, takes federal dollars and we have not been willing to, to, to make that happen as a society. Um, I don't think we've succeeded very well creating mixed income communities. We, we, there are many uh, measures now of greater inequality by class and race in the United States than even back to this period of the 1950s. And um, this issue, I'll just close on the issue of the, the, that, uh, that you both touched on of this, our, our difficulty <laughs> operating beyond the locality. The unwillingness to have metropolitan problem solving regional planning, um, leaving, you know, then creating a world of the haves and the have-nots because where you live, that address, that community, that tax base determines the quality of your services, of your schools, of your transportation, of so many things. And so our, you know, unwillingness, our dependence on that, that locality and as a uh, and local property taxes for revenue. Connecticut being, you know, out there with New Jersey, I think, as probably the most property tax dependent state, um, you know, leads to these kind of problems. And I think my own view is until we take on the big scale of them, we will just continue to, 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 to struggle with many of these problems. Well, I'd like to open up uh, to our audience, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the notion of like can't trust the private sector to protect the public interest shaped the way that urban renewal um, and planning in general happened during the low period and also during the renewal period in New London because it seems like this really complicated contradiction. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, because you know we've always had public-private partnerships. I mean, that nothing happens just by government in the United States all the way back. You know, it's always been a combination of public-private. Public, um, I think what changes over time is who's in the driver's seat. Um, and one of the things that I do value in the urban renewal period is the, uh, the willingness of the federal government to play some role in urban redevelopment, even if some of the things that happened were misguided in the ways that we've talked about. Today, I see many cities struggling to try to figure out how to solve these serious problems that we've talked about by basically having to squeeze uh, resources out of the private sector. So having inclusionary zoning, if you want your market uh, priced housing in downtown Boston, you need to build, in Boston now, it's 13% of your units have to be affordable or you pay into a fund that, and that housing will more likely get built in what is already a low income neighborhood. 
um, tr trying to attract an Amazon or a GE, which we stole from you in Connecticut, and then they left they up and left Boston as well after kind of going broke. Um, so that you know, there's, I think the balance today uh, is 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 problematic because uh, the I think a lot of the choices there's an, an area of Boston called the, the Boston Seaport area, which is I think just a uh, a quintessential statement of what happens when there's no planning and it's just what the private sector wants to build that they think will will bear some profit. And so it just is, you know, one hotel and convention center and very expensive condo after another. It's a neighborhood, if you can call it that now, that has the largest percentage of, of upper class white population of anywhere in the city because there just has been no attention to some of these other issues. So um, finding that balance, we're ne always going to have to have public and private doing this together. But um, I like to feel that the what it, if we can even understand what the public interest and the public good is, and that's a complicated proposition. We haven't even talked about NIMBYism and uh, all the issues about you know whose voice is really speaking for the community. But to the extent that you know, we can get at that because we have a process where we try to bring as many people to the table as we can, then I'd like to think that that's dictating what's happening, not what, you know, a court where, what a corporation thinks will be the most profitable um, investment to make in a city. So I, too, had written down this quote from Ed Lowe that you can't trust the private sector with public interest. And I think, in a sense, this very conversation we're having is operating at the level of the private sector. And so I'm wondering if you believe that too much of the discourse and modern critique surrounding urban renewal exists in a sort of elitist echo chamber, and whether the manner of conversation with which we discuss urban renewal needs to further cross socioeconomic, socioeconomic boundaries to avoid perpetuating the very problems that we study. <laughs> Maybe you that people should. That will require an academic. But, no, but, you know, I would be interested to hear your your practitioners working in this field how you experience the public-private balancing act that is really at the core of, of of all these issues. I think is you know it's 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 about dollars and you know who's really determining how they're going to be spent and what we're going to do with them. I mentioned model cities in my response to the first question. And if I understand model cities correctly, it, it's, um, it was like urban renewal phase two or three. Wow. Um, and and it, it, it too had its own form. It lasted 10 or 15 years, as I recall. No, not even, no, that, not even that, that long, no, no. But no, it no. did it, require um, public participation, citizen <laughs> participation. And, 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 so, and so did so did renewal. I guess the question becomes, you know, what's the appropriate uh, extent of, of public participation? You did have a planning process where public was involved as these plans were getting uh, uh, getting involved. So you know, at that time there wasn't social media at all. There were in a room like this, people would get together presentations, you know, would be made, people would, would comment in the like, you know, was that enough? We, we then revert to the, the formalized process of the local governing body, who is, you know, they're getting tapped on the, particularly in a little town like New London, you know, six square miles, the advantage is uh, your, your elected representatives cannot hide from you, so they citizens here tapping people on the shoulder. I know I was stopped in the grocery store a thousand times about uh, uh, one issue or another. Uh, and so, the, you know, a consensus gets developed and it gets formalized by by a vote. There were, uh, I know certainly I'm not sure about Winthrop, but I know that the Shaw Cove project went through a referendum process. There was there was a, a, a debate in, in the town. The political parties took uh, uh, took positions, and the citizens came out and they said yes or no. We're going to do this, or we're not going to do it. So I mean, that's isn't that the basis for our uh, uh, 
you know, participation, it comes to a point. You know, there are some people unhappy with that and others saying that's, that's what we should do. So, you know, I think that's, that's, that's our system. Um, when we got to Model Cities, uh, we then started a, a, a much more fine-grained process around a series of, of, of kind of, of, of issues. Uh, uh, around uh, lack of jobs and no, no training, education, uh, uh, kind of medical uh, uh, issues, substance abuse, lack of housing. And uh, the community was engaged with a lot of outreach, particularly to the minority communities, where uh, instead of the public coming to City Hall, City Hall, at least the planning process and the and the uh, elected officials and appointed officials that were involved would go into usually using schools because that's the closest uh, uh, facility of any scale that uh, would have. So there were there were hundreds and hundreds of meetings to discuss issues that resulted in uh, in, in specific plans and much of it directed towards additional or, or revised social services, not necessarily the physical. The physical tended to be very fine-grained. We haven't had a sidewalk on my street uh, that was walkable for 50 years, fix it. Or, you know, my park is terrible. Let's, uh, we need some swings, we need a place for the kids to play. Let's, how about, let's adapt uh, and, and, and put some, uh, uh, some playscapes in, the school because the school is functioning after school as as a as a community collection point so rather than kind of the big picture you're you're the little picture of where people live so you know I, I think that was that was a dramatic improvement and people who kind of got involved who were never involved in, in any kind of kind of public uh, discourse before after 10, 15 years, some of them are elected on the city council. They got engaged and became became a voice. And you you got you got the, certainly the minority community in this town uh, uh, involved through that through that process. Even though it was 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 shortly lived and it changed uh, it changed the direction. Then you went into the community development block grant, where you got a set amount of money each year, and then the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, uh, help recommend how the, uh, all, all the organizations would uh, present their projects to them, and they they would would have a voice on where the dollars would get allocated. And of course, the council changes what they thought. I I think that's a great description of what happened then. Um, in today's age, though, there is a uh, there is a, a federal emphasis, federal requirement that we go beyond what we traditionally did in terms of reaching um, underrepresented populations, folks that don't come out, don't join committees, may not be a member of a political party. And there are requirements called Title VI in the Federal Highway Act, uh, environmental justice programs, um, where we have to go out and we have to seek people out before we build a road through their neighborhood and we have to discuss it with them. I'm sure it was happening back then. Yeah. But I think what Urban Renewal did, it resulted in the federal government recognizing it needed to change the rules as to how cities and towns around the country were going to deal with their built environment, deal with their uh, transportation infrastructure. And everybody has a voice now, if they want to have a voice. Um, so you guys, this was great to hear you uh, talk about your own, what you observed and participated in. And I, it's actually a major part of what I write about in that I chart a shift from what I, in the 1950s, what I call um, pluralist democracy, which was, yes, there were mandates in that federal legislation that there be community input, but, but in a city like New Haven, where Logue was working in the 1950s, their assumption was that a public official like uh, Logue and those he worked with actually were uh, representing the public good. They were that that and that they would in, they would consult with um, representatives of established interest groups, and so they created this community-wide organization 
that had representatives from every group like the PTA and the business community and um, the Red Cross and the NAACP, but there'd be very, they would be void, the people would speak for these very established interest groups. And it wasn't that they, I mean, one of the points I really make is that they weren't being intentionally undemocratic in that not opening that up more broadly. They actually felt that they were being democratic, but coming out of World War II, they were very afraid of, you know, what they had seen happen in Europe and what the, the mob and what, what democracy could be like if it kind of was um, not controlled. And so there was this sense that we have a participatory, we have a, a you know, consultative process of these established interest groups. By the 1960s, the, the, the world changes totally. And that I call a participatory democracy. And it comes, I don't think, so much from the top down. I think the feds and you know, people like Logue would have been perfectly happy to continue to make decisions for communities, um, feeling that they were doing it with the community's interests at heart. It really came from people pushing back and saying, wait a minute, you're not consulting with the people who are being affected by these programs. And so, and it was particularly the, in New Haven, in a city like New Haven, it was the African American community that really said, wait a minute, we're being pushed, even though the, the established uh, NAACP and CORE and many of those people really thought a renewal would help their people because they would, it would open up parts of the city for housing that had been closed off through a kind of segregated housing market, real estate market. That wasn't what was happening. And so kind of grassroots people started to push back and say, wait a minute, we've got to have much more community input. And then the, 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 the situation changed. And today we live in a world that some people think is perhaps too participatory and that it's going to be very difficult to make decisions that affect a city as a whole because every neighborhood has its own sort of mentality, NIMBY sort of investment. Um, and so I think we face different kinds of challenges today. There's lots of community input that can actually stop change when taken too far. But I think this is a very important historical process that was both pushed from the bottom as well as recognized as a necessity by the top. We have a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't um, remember in any of the urban renewal projects there being a lot of citizen public participation. Uh, the, the first project, the winter project, you no, know, even the ones before that, the little parking lot ones, were um, pretty much driven by the Chamber of Commerce and by the, uh, the merchants, the, the downtown merchants. They were pretty much the force behind that. Um, and uh, and even, even as late as, as the, uh, the Fort Trumbull project, they had neighborhood meetings, but they were really people came in uh, and, and talked down to the people and said, well, what do you think of, of this plan that we're, we've already decided we're going to do? Um, and uh, so I'm not sure that there was not all that much participation. Model Cities were even something, I think the Model Cities program was basically put out of business by the, uh, by the establishment. Um, and I can think of in the newspaper. Um, we, um, the, we did an our first the day did our first investigative uh, project on the Model City pro 